I'm Jennifer Gilmore and I'm an author and advocate for women in abusive relationships. I want to get to the answers to the questions that many have from those that work in the domestic abuse sector, getting an inside feel of what it's really like in their job role and sharing it with all of you. Hi everyone, welcome to the 11th interview, Hashtag Abuse Talk Interviews. I'm so delighted today to have Natalie Page uh, join us. Eventually, this was planned probably about 20 minutes ago, but we had some tech issues. But I'm delighted that we managed to make it and I'm glad that you're joining us. So Natalie Page um, is founder of The Court Said and she's recently um, had a protest that she's developed and created in Parliament Square in London. And I don't want to talk too much because I want Natalie to explain it all to you um, about what she does. So Natalie, can you tell us a bit about you, um, about the court said, and also what the protest in Parliament Square was all about, <laughs> in a nutshell? Right, okay. So the court said is um, the campaign for survivor family justice. Um, we focus on the survivor experience um, from the whole family's perspective. Um, upon entering the court system and going through the family court system in the UK, um, particularly at the moment. Uh, we are talking about domestic abuse cases, genuine evidence domestic abuse cases. Um, the protest was actually the first um, of its kind in that um, it was very successful. It was a really effective vehicle to raise awareness for the issues that face survivors in the court system and it was actually set up to be a community effort with organizations allies activists and individual survivors themselves all uniting in condemnation of the family court and its treatment of survivors which the stories coming out of this uh, out of court at the moment are barbaric horrendous and heartbreaking um so our main focus for the protest was primarily to raise awareness but also to bring all those organizations and people together to unite um, in, in terms of delivering some direct action to hopefully for start facilitating some meaningful changes for people. Wow, I mean, that's just powerful in itself and you've just grasped it in a nutshell in a way. Um, well, why did you decide to, you know, bring the court said to the world <laughs> oh that's a slightly longer story um <laughs> <laughs> which i can't tell all of it unfortunately okay. um needless to say yes i have been personally affected um for many many years um i can't say any more on that unfortunately mm. because that is still ongoing um however what I started to wonder, this was years ago, quite a few years ago, I obviously um, had my first round of um, court and I was horrified at how I'd been treated and I didn't expect it and I had no clue that that was in store for me. Um, and I was wondering, is, is it just me? You know, mm -hmm. did I do something wrong? And it took me quite a few years to start reaching out. When I did start reaching out, I started to notice that, no, it wasn't just me and it wasn't just my story. There's actually thousands and thousands of us. Mm. So I started gathering information from survivors in the system. And the phrase that popped up every time was, I thought we were going to be protected, mm. but the court said no. Um, or I thought this would happen, but the court said no. So that's where the name came from, the court said, because that was just this sort of recurring phrase that just kept coming to me was, was the court said this or the court said that and what it actually meant for domestic abuse survivors. Um, so, yeah, that's basically how it started. And its aims are to completely change uh, through robust changes in law. Uh, changes in narrative and attitudes and levels of training um, to affect real-time change for survivors on the ground uh, experience in the rough end, what currently is the rough end of mm. family justice. Yeah, and um, just to say that, you know, you started this with 
the UK in mind, but I know that people have wanted to sort of adopt this into their other countries, haven't they? Yeah, so yeah, it's be after the becoming... protest particularly, <laughs> yeah. Um, we've had a lot of feedback from around the world and we are looking now to reach out into other countries. The worrying pattern that I've noticed from the data coming out of other countries, in particular um, New Zealand, Australia, United States and Europe, is that although the local laws and customs, um, cultures are all different, the stories are the same. Mm. Um, the stories are all exactly the same. So that tells me that really the seriousness of the problem is actually in narrative mm. rather than law. This is, this is about how we react to abuse on an institutional level and that certainly needs in my opinion a global conversation about mm. how we treat domestic abuse yes and um you know we're talking about the process and clearly it's made an impact and it can't you i suppose you've partially answered uh, my next question but um you know what impact did you want from the protest and um, what and what did you what did you get from it you know so looking at what was the aim and then what was the outcome of that protest <laughs> well we wanted to achieve a few things as a result of um conducting some direct action like protesting um we aim to raise awareness first and foremost um and i've already touched on the reasons why is because people generally don't have a clue before they enter this system what is in store for them within mm -hmm. it so we wanted to sort of blow the lid off that and and tell people hey this is this is how the system is you know because people need to be aware mm -hmm. they really do um we also wanted to show um a display of strength if you like um to sort of show the depth of the feeling and you know how disappointed and angry we are about how we've been treated in the system and to also showcase the heartbreaking stories that have been coming out of the system and the evidence of some really systemic injustices that are happening every single day um here for, you know and globally in the in the family court system and i think we did achieve that mm. the um feedback that we've had from around the world has been absolutely incredible um so you know this was a it, it was a show of strength but it is also the beginning it's a small beginning mm. um and we do have um other bigger plans which i'll come to in a minute <laughs> no and i mean how did you feel about the outcome because um for those of the, that you that don't know i was there on the day um and it was oh my gosh i don't think um for, for, for what I do and talking about it all the time, I kind of decompartmentalize things. But yeah. that day really sort of stuck with me and it's still, I'm still thinking over the things that were said and the certain speakers that really, you know, made me feel quite upset of what situation they were in and how they weren't listened to and um, this utter frustration. Um, but it was an emotional day. Um, how, how were you? um happy with the amount of people that turned up were you, you know how many were you, you expecting how do you think the overall picture of it went <laughs> wow um to be honest i was very pleased with the turnout because it's the biggest one that's ever been done um of its kind um so i was very happy with that however we need more yeah. we do we need more and more people who are willing to stand up and be counted um you know, because, I mean, we did um, raise awareness. We did get a significant number of people there. But the, the huge factor for, for a campaign like this is fear. Mm. Because um, the, the fear of contempt of court, um, the fear of being identified, being perhaps photographed, all those sorts of things do conspire against um any efforts to create sort of a public platform like that mm. so i was really really happy with with the numbers that we had but again we need more we need we need more and more all the time to get this mm. issue to be a thing of the past which is really quite frankly where it belongs 
So, and I suppose it's re- it's it is difficult, as you said, because you know a lot of people are st- still probably going through the family court system and are maybe perhaps worried about um, what impacts that might make on 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 that side of things. Um, however, if if we all just put that aside and all turned up, then they can't argue with everybody that's <laughs> going through it. Um, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> I completely agree um, with that side of it. Um, so obviously we've had some questions that put out there, get people to ask questions and if they feel like they're able to. Um, and some of them were regarding child maintenance and legal matters. Um, mm. And I suppose when I was reading the questions, they were for more of a, I don't know, what if you want to call it, Natalie, like a professional legal person. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> and obviously you know your background is that you're there as a campaigner so it may be that you just give some of your opinions to uh as a response but if um if they wanted to get answers to their question those questions are you able to sign post them for support um and find something that's able to help them usually yeah i mean it the support the support is difficult because there is a distinct lack um of meaningful support um for survivors in the court system obviously because we are not allowed to share our stories Mm. um or our cases with anyone so that you know tends to sort of put a spanner in the works however what we usually find is that once we have an idea of the specifics of the case or the inquiry question um we usually can signpost to someone who might be able to help, who might be very knowledgeable on the subject. But in terms of real on the ground support in every town in the UK, it doesn't actually exist. There's pockets of excellence, um, but it is it is few and far between. But nine times out of 10, we usually manage to connect survivors with someone who will be beneficial. Mm. yeah no that's great so the questions are um some of us are told not to mention domestic abuse in the family court system at all um yeah you know why do you think this is why are we told this (laughs) Uh, you know that's actually quite a big question um the main the main reason the usual the practical reason is is that you know you would even be advised this sometimes by your own representation mm. um it, you know it's happened to most of us um where your barrister comes in and goes yeah we're just we're just not going to mention the you know the domestic abuse because you know judges don't like it well okay so judges might not like it but this is a relevant concern. 62% mm. of domestic abusers go on to further abuse their own children directly. Mm. This is a serious safeguarding concern. And if judges don't want to listen, which they clearly don't, uh, well, most of them don't, um, then we need to force this issue because it should not be a taboo subject in this day and age. We are in 2019. Mm. Okay. Um, this is not a taboo anymore. There is a perception from um, barristers in particular that unless you turn up half dead or black and blue um, with bruises, that then you will not be listened to about domestic abuse because, you know, we also see a shocking lack of um, understanding about mm-hmm. coercive control and the, and the effects that that has, particularly on children and survivors themselves um and they you know we've even had testimony and where judges have said sorry i don't know what you mean by coercive control so it's this it's this lack of informed decision making that that leads to people just saying do you know what it's best not to mention it you know and it can bias a judge against you as well um and often we find that is reported as well where if you bring it up you are then punished Mm. um for daring to suggest it and so and they usually do pretty much anything to not find it as fact as well so yeah there are a lot of barriers even to just bringing it up and that really needs to stop i mean that is just it's draconian well like if you're looking at the general statistic of it it's going to be a common theme 
Um, and somebody told me, which I thought was interesting, is if, you, if you're in a healthy relationship and you break down, you kind of do contact arrangement between yourselves because you're civilised and you are able to do that. So potentially the most of us that are going into the family court system, it's because there isn't that healthy side of the relationship. And, and it really got me thinking yeah. because... Yeah, I mean, if my husband, hopefully that won't happen, if we split up, we will be like, right, this is what's going to happen. And we don't have any need to take it down that route. And nor would we want to after no. you know, seeing what happens. Exactly. <laughs> now, a lot of survivors also report that they um, get taken to court extremely quickly mm. um, after leaving, which does suggest that from the... Uh, the perspective of the abuser it is an act of control because yeah. those avenues of normal parenting and normal co-parenting after separation aren't explored mm. and they aren't done because their goal is to punish the mm. victim for leaving um, and to exert controlled uh, coercively over the survivor family this are in court within four days of leaving is the quickest mm. that i've heard four days so i don't really think that abusers generally um do explore the possibility of a normal separation mm, yeah no that's uh, really interesting to hear and really you know something that all those aspects should be considered and looked into um as as a reason to you know prove that there might be an issue um, and that's what it is isn't it it feels like you're constantly yeah. justifying yourself and trying to prove your character and trying to say look this isn't all in my head i've been told it for the last how many years um so it's an utterly frustrating system um there are also so many of us that don't feel very good mm about social workers and their decision making so if we think they've made um a decision an incorrect decision about our children um what 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 should we do about that <laughs> always complain always always complain um part of the problem is though that with the complaints the way the procedures that are actually set up within the system is that you actually have to complain pretty much while your case is ongoing and as a survivor in front of say for example a CAFCAS officer or social worker who has the ability to take your children from you um, the act of complaining becomes an extremely risky act um, because you know that case, that person may not be removed from your case your complaint may not be upheld nine times out of ten they investigate themselves the pro process needs changing pronto in that department confidently oh but we don't have many problems in our system and whereas you know we're saying actually you do mm. it's just that people aren't complaining because they're terrified that if they do that their case would be adversely affected yeah so it is a tightrope but i would say just you know do it as soon as you can after the case is um closing or their report is finished just complain as soon as possible and get it looked at keep your evidence keep every file and always apply for sars subject access requests um to get all of your data and all the data that they hold on you mm. so that you can actually see in a little more depth how they've arrived at decisions and then you can actually challenge it mm. um so i would say definitely always 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 challenge things if you can in such a way whereas you know you're sort of doing it in a professional way and you know you will need to evidence that um but apart from that, really, I would just say just keep interacting with the campaign. It's very fast moving. Mm. And there's always updates um, and, you know, things change. So I'm hoping soon that their complaints policies will be looked at to bring them more in line with the survivor experience. Yeah, no, that sounds great. I mean, I've um, I tried to complain um, 
about a, a calf cast worker after uh, the final order was made and I was told I wasn't able to because it was outside the six months from the report so it didn't matter that the report was made up months slash years ago I mean as a, a vulnerable person yeah. as a survivor how on earth did I feel confident to look at the situation and go this feels wrong when I'm there trusting in the system and thinking I'm safe now it's okay um so it's only on yeah. hindsight or when you educate yourself that you go hang on I'm looking back and I can see where the fault it lies and this could have been avoided x mm -hmm. y and z so yeah um hopefully yeah. we can look at that maybe together as well um and can go through all of the paperwork that I have got <laughs> um <laughs> that is back. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, on that note, I do want to say a big thank you for having me speak at the protest. It is something I that haven't really spoken about in the public because it's obviously something you're concerned about and worried about talking about openly. Um, but I felt that you know it was a place where we were able to do that. Um, it was. I felt like a weight had been lifted off my shoulder and I felt that I wasn't isolated again. I mean, as survivors in general, you can be very isolated. Um, and that's why I set mm -hmm. up Abuse Talk. So this just brought a whole new level to me that it was like, and listening to things like, um, I think Victoria and um, Haig's story really has like, I don't want to say traumatized me, but it really upset me and it made me think, it could have been it's a horrific story yeah, yeah. Um, it, it, do you know what it could have been any of us yeah it honestly could have been um it's the system will do what the system is currently doing and really what we've found from all the data um the you know masses and masses of it that we've been gathering for quite some time what we've actually found is that there is just basically a spectrum of misery and it just depends where you fall upon that spectrum mm. as to how severely you will be dealt with and treated and Victoria Hayes case is certainly a very severe case it's a complete miscarriage of justice as will become evident now with her future campaigning so do watch that mm. um, however I really honestly feel that the reason this needed to be public was because that when we do this in conferences and workshops and groups we are preaching to the converted we are yeah. telling people what they already know they already know there's problems in the system because they're in there mm. um we need to be telling other people because it's the people that are about to enter it that need to know um you know so we, we really need to stop preaching to the converters and actually open this up for some public scrutiny and public dialogue no i completely agree um well you know looking at the future then of the court said what is in store you know what what are your planners <laughs> i want to know <laughs> well, we've actually got a lot of projects on the go at the moment but on the whole we um we actually plan to continue with direct action mm -hmm. um we we plan to continue exerting political pressure um obviously the election has been a bit of a curveball in that yeah. department but that won't be long and, and <laughs> we can start being a lot more active in that department um, we're also working very closely with other organisations in the field on a lot of collaborative projects to assist survivors with real-time support and the benefit of our now huge network. Um, so we do have a lot going on behind the scenes, like I said, that protest was just the beginning. Um, we have a long way to go. We do have a mountain to climb, I think, um, in terms of narratives especially the damaging narratives that seem to abound about domestic abuse are just everywhere and you know breaking those down is possibly one of the longest and hardest jobs because it's about people's opinions and experiences mm. and and what they soak up from society and all those narratives that people take on without hardly even realizing it half the time so we've got a lot to do and a lot of barriers to break down, but we are definitely on it. Determined. <laughs> Determined is yeah. probably the I'm word, isn't it? Stop. I'm not <laughs> stopping. 
<laughs> Absolutely. If it's the last thing I do, we will change this system. <laughs> so I can't, I, do you know oh. what? I've got to the stage now where I get so many stories every day that I just, some days I think I can't take reading another one. I just can't mm -hmm. take it. And I'd just like to see a day one day where I no longer get that sort of message or email or communication phone call. I'd like for someone to be able to contact me and go, hey, do you know what? Um, this went right. You yeah. Know? And everything's good now. And I'll be like, fantastic. That's the goal. I think we've got a long way to go. But that's how I would like to leave things. I think you expect the... the um you expect the odd, you know, in my head, the odd complaint, just like with any company or organization. Yeah. Um, but you don't expect the mass that there is. And I mean, I was trying to explain it to somebody who was like, think of like it as a company, you know, like Apple. I'm a big Apple fan. If something goes wrong with my stuff, even if it's 10 years old, they will fix it because it's still a complaint. It's still valid. And it's like, how can you have? A bracket on complaining or you know all these I don't know boundaries and restrictions they can't progress without taking on what we're saying um, if they took on what exactly. we're saying then they would be able to implement improve and maybe they wouldn't have so much complaining going on and well this is it and you know it's funny you should use a product as an analogy there because really if you think about it if people were dying right or if children were dying right as a result of your product that's on sale you've yeah. got an imaginary product now but people have died as a result of it you would be duty bound legally yeah. bound to recall your product mm. and to subject it to rigorous safety testing Mm. Now, there's been plenty of child homicides that have been as a direct result of family court decisions. So if your product had caused these deaths and it would be recalled, but yet in real life, you know, your, your children are at risk and then others that have been harmed or even murdered, yet there is no scrutiny on the system, there is no um, safeguarding, there's no, not even a lessons learned. Yeah. Um, you know, and that seems to be the stock standard phrase and we haven't even heard that yet. So, you know, I think really it just shows you then as a society that we place more value on products than our people. Yeah. So after all that, how can people get on board with the court said, how can people support you in the work you're doing, whether they are able to, you know, well, there's your support or whether they want to do it silently. Well, there's absolutely loads of ways you can support. Um, really um, effective ways as well, um, large and small. So depending on how much you want to interact, um, you can support by just following the platforms. We've, um, we're on Instagram, we're on Twitter, and we have our Facebook page as well. You can support by sharing our content and spreading the word. Um, interacting commenting you can send us your stories you can email us you can contact us on so many ways um, and your stories um, will always go to creating um, data for research um, or contributing to um, call for a uh, course for stories from the press all those sorts of things we do facilitate that for journalists as well and so you can you can join in um, just even on those levels, um, just letting us know what's going on and, and just taking part. You can donate um, to our cause as well because we do have to um, fund the campaign as well. And at the moment we are crowdfunded entirely. Um, so this is by survivors, funded by survivors and it's for survivors. Um, so please donate. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's only a pound every donation does count um you can buy merchandise in our shopify shop which is the court said dot my shopify dot com um you can uh, wear our t-shirts or badges and uh and whatever other merchandise are you gonna, are you gonna show off your t-shirt all the time you're gonna show your t-shirt hang on i don't know whether you can see this very well woohoo <laughs> Injustice is everyone's <laughs> business. Well, it is, isn't it? Let's be honest. It affects everybody. 
Um, so yeah, if you do if you do buy something from us, um, wear it, snap a picture, put it on your Instagram or your story on Facebook or on Twitter, and just use our hashtag hashtag what said so that we can see it as well. Um, also attend any of our events that we will have coming up in 2020, um, which we will be releasing shortly after Christmas. Mm. So yeah, so there's lots and lots of ways to interact. Just you know, just get involved. Yeah, and it's just basically searching the court said, isn't it? It'll pop up pretty much straight away, won't it? Um, and yeah, the other thing, yeah, plug it into any platform. Yeah, and the uh, the other thing, um, if they want to get in touch with you personally, um, how would they do that? Um, that's actually best by email. Mm-hmm. Um, so that is the court said at gmail dot com. Thank you. And what I'll do is I'll pop all of the information that you've spoken about. So the links to uh, your, all your social media, your um, you know Shopify and, and everything in the information. So if anybody wants to click on to the description, then you can go through to all of Natalie's, uh, the court said's information and check it out there. So that leaves me with saying a huge thank you, Natalie. I was, I'm so you, happy you. that we decided to do this. Um, it's, yeah so important the work that you are doing and I will be there um on your on your side supporting you in what way I can so please oh. get in touch with me and ask if you need anything yeah. um we'll tweet and we'll do everything and that leaves me oh, to thank you there. no problem at all that's um, absolutely amazing support and we you know we have obviously now grown a platform to you know we've got an amazing amount of huge reach lots and lots of survivors but we need the organizations and the influencers Mm -hmm. to also help us with this work and getting the message out there so your support is so valuable and so appreciated thank you oh no thank you and I, i i mean i think everybody you know everybody's sort of that were there on the day were contributing in their in their own ways and it was just such a you know delight and oh passion <laughs> that we're all coming yeah, together. Really a lot of that. Um, so for those of you who are watching live on the broadcast, you can head over to Twitter now and join in the this week's discussion on hashtag abuse talk. Um, we talk every single week on a Wednesday, at eight till nine pm GMT, um, and discuss everything domestic abuse. Um, it can be um, not very nice topics sometimes, but we also have positive and motivational, and we understand if you need to take a week off, and um, we're going to be there every week. And it also means that I need to say that um, a Merry Christmas, because <laughs> that is going to happen. It is going to be uh, Christmas soon, and um, we will be tweeting because it Wednesday is Christmas Day, and we will still be tweeting. So don't worry, um, because domestic abuse has no time it's every day every place every hour every minute and um, so we'll still be tweeting on christmas day and new year's day but the next hashtag abuse talk interview will be on the 8th of january normally we have it on the first wednesday but it's new year's day and we felt that it would be best just to shift that one however still tweeting so that's a positive um, so i want to say a big thank you for everyone for watching and joining in and again a big thank you to natalie for agreeing to be interviewed about something so clo- you know close to her heart um, and the campaign and the efforts that you've been putting into, it's just been outstanding. So thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Yay. <laughs> <laughs>